for those of you joining us um, from the cohort and from elsewhere, welcome to uh, the Dream It webinar series. Our topic today is all about storytelling. Uh, the fun title of today is Once Upon a Time in Startup Land, How to Tell Your Story. But um, I think at, at its core, the discussion today is going to be around the power of storytelling um, in, in the context of building your business, raising money, uh, pitching in general, locking in customers, all of the wonderful tasks that startups are, are doing on a very regular basis and the kinds of challenges that founders know all too well. Uh, and maybe possibly one of the areas that not all founders are super comfortable selling themselves and telling a story. I think that's uh, that can be a, a very big challenge. So uh, by way of introduction, my name is Seth Burke. I serve as the uh, Chief Marketing Officer here for Dreamit. I actually have a background in uh, digital marketing, advertising, uh, and business development. So the concept of storytelling is near and dear to my heart. Um, but it's not about me today. It's really about this distinguished panel that we've put together, uh, which includes um, Richard Schwartz, the SVP at Digitas Health, uh, Hilary Ray, uh, for the founder of Tell Me a Story, Barani Rajakumar, who is the founder of LearnBop, and Jen Mayer, the creative director of Omada Health. I'm going to allow them to uh, introduce themselves with a little bit more gusto than I did there. Um, we're going to, again, get into a discussion today around the power of storytelling. So um, why don't I let you guys introduce yourselves real quick, and uh, we'll get into it from there. All right. Uh, hey, I'll go first. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Barani Rajakumar, um, founder and CEO of a startup called LearnBop. Um, so I started the company while I was a grad student at Carnegie Mellon and then I uh, went through the Dream It class actually in uh, 2011 in New York City and um, had a lot of fun there, had a lot of success. We ultimately ended up getting acquired uh, in 2014 uh, by a publicly traded company called K12 Inc. And so I'm um, excited to talk to you about storytelling today and how important it is to get your first customer, first investor, uh, first employee, whatever. Great. I'll go next. Thanks. Uh, this is Richard Schwartz. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Seth, thanks for inviting me. So I work at Publicis Health in our division called Digitas Health, where I lead marketing innovations and I also lead our strategic partnerships and alliances in Connected Health. Uh, you all should know, and you're probably, you've probably heard about Publicis 90, where back in July, we backed 90 startups, and I am one of the folks mentoring a bunch of those individuals and companies, so I'm really excited about that. Before coming to Digitas Health, I spent time at WebMD about 10 years, and prior to that, I worked in agency and also worked in a pharma company. But uh, for those of you that are in FinTech or EdTech, I've also spent time in those industries. So I'm looking forward to great questions. I'll go next. My name is Hillary Ray, and I'm the founder of Tell Me a Story, which is here in Philadelphia. And Tell Me a Story produces live storytelling events. We run workshops for individuals, and uh, most importantly, we work with different companies to help implement storytelling in various capacities. So whether that's a professional development workshop or consulting or collaborating on specific storytelling projects, we do it all. And I also perform as a storyteller. So I share stories from my own life on stage. Nice. Where can okay. we get tickets to that, by the way? <laughs> Want to put a plug in? Uh, well, Tell Me a Story has a show next Wednesday in Philadelphia uh, at Shot Tower Coffee. It's first come, first serve for seats, and it fills up very quickly. So. Oh, that's cool. In Philly? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Jen? Awesome. I guess that leaves me. I'm Jen Mayer. I am the creative director at Omada Health. I've uh, been there for about a year. And before that, I was the design director and storyteller brand strategist at IDEO in San Francisco. I also um, uh, wrote and, and teach the IDEOU storytelling class, which is available online. It's IDEOU, is IDEO's kind of brand new online learning platform. And then before that, I spent about 10 years in advertising as a copywriter um, and creative director as well. So long line of, of storytelling all the way back through that. Fantastic. 
Well, again, thank you guys so much for joining us for this today. And uh, I think from a formatting standpoint, what we're going to work on is uh, going back and forth with some questions that uh, I've prepared. Hopefully that prompts some conversation, uh, but leaving some time towards the end to do Q&A from the audience and we can open it up to uh, uh, questions, which I'll receive here and then direct to each or all of you uh, as we go along. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Sounds great. Sort of miss the applause from the audience in this format, but I'll, I'll, I'll learn to get used to it. Um, so I, I want to actually open things up with a little bit of science before I get into a question, because when I was doing some research into storytelling, you, you see a lot of things that say the art of storytelling, but you also see a lot of things that say the science of storytelling. And I think that in, in today's discussion, we should be hitting on both of them. Um, especially since we have some people on the healthcare side represented in the panel and as well as in the cohort. Uh, and I think science would resonate quite nicely. So I, I found these three very interesting uh, effects that storytelling has on the brain. The first of which is neurocoupling, uh, which without being too scientific, is all about the listener associating the story with their own ideas and their own experiences. And I think that's tremendously important. I think that's gonna come out in today's discussion quite a bit. The other one was mirroring which is where the, the listener um, is actually having a similar experience during the story as the storyteller. So one can interpret that as if the storyteller is down and mopey like this, then the listener is gonna sort of feel the same way. So the importance of, uh, of being up and, 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 and projection. Uh, and of course, the release of dopamine, um, which if you can generate excitement and emotion during the telling of a story, it actually makes uh, I, I think it's obvious that it makes a greater impact, but what I didn't realize is that the release of dopamine actually makes it easier for someone to remember the story and makes that memory more accurate. So from a scientific standpoint, I thought that was tremendously important as part of this, today's discussion. So uh, when I think about storytelling for startups, one of the first things that comes to mind is pitching, right? Startups are pitching on a very regular basis. So Rich, I'm gonna open up this question with you at being part of an agency. I think this is a key component to what you guys deliver on behalf of your clients. But how important is it to really understand your audience prior to doing a presentation or a pitch? And should we think about having different narratives for different audiences? That, that's a great question, Seth. First, I, I think in, in every story and in every campaign, when, when we're walking into a pitch, when I'm walking into a pitch, I like to craft what, what I call the North Star. And the North Star is the thing that we, we organize around and we always organize around it. Um, we're, not, we're not selling products in, in story, right? Because people don't buy products. They buy better versions of themselves or they buy better versions of their company. So having that organizing idea that you tell stories toward is essential. You might be giving your pitch in in a corporate office, you might be giving your pitch to somebody in, in a biker bar where it's one on one, depending on your environment, I think you have to adapt because of who you're talking to. But I believe you should always stay true to that North Star. And I'll talk a little bit more later about how we arrive at that and how we utilize that as a tool. Jen, what do you think in terms of audiences? Does it matter? Um, from audience to audience, should we be tailoring our, our story every single time? Do we need a single narrative that always works? I think you need to have a single idea that you're sort of hitting on again and again, and you might have sort of different ways that you tell the story. If you think about the way that we're natural storytellers with each other, right? If I sit down with you at a bar and I tell you a story about, you know, this thing that happened to me once in college, I might tell it to you a certain way, and I might tell it to my parents in a slightly different way yeah, or definitely. you know somebody who I'm thinking maybe I want to hang out with a little bit more in a, in a slightly different way but the story itself there's those core elements that are going to remain the same and if you have to think about if you start switching too many core elements around then your story is going to ring false like what is that truth core what's that thing that you're always going to be hitting on and then you can adapt it slightly to your different audiences based mm -hmm. on sort of what they need to get out of the story Barani, you mentioned that you sold your company. Uh, obviously, that doesn't happen from a singular meeting. Um, from meeting to meeting, were you making tweaks based on who you were talking to or based on reactions you got uh, in previous meetings? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think like to what you were saying before, like storytelling is a hundred percent psychological. And so what, hopefully what you're doing in your meetings is you're looking out like what are the really important things to the receiver of your story. And you're taking your core points as was discussed before and like tailoring it to how like your story actually um, fits into the narrative of your customer or, or in this case, the, the acquirer. Um, and if that fit is there, it's kind of like, you know, docking a ship on something like, you know, then your story is connected and you're, you're going to get the impact you want. But if you're just saying the same thing over and over again, um, it's unlikely that that will connect or resonate and your story will go stale. I'm going to ask you, if you have a hard wire to plug in uh, while we go through a few more questions, it might be helpful. You're freezing and, and breaking up us on, uh, on us a little bit here. Um, but Hillary, I'm actually going to switch gears a little bit, um, even though you're probably the only person who actually gets up on stage and talks to different audiences. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk a little bit and ask you a little bit about authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is spoken about as tremendously important in a lot of areas of storytelling, pitching, and otherwise. And um, how do you how do you help to convey authenticity, whether it's in your onstage experiences or more your your, your business related experiences? I think it's important as a storyteller, as a performer of stories or telling stories within the business context, I think it's really important to be open about the experiences that you've had. So what I mean is you're not just sharing all of the wonderful, amazing things that have happened to you, but you're, you're sharing the steps of how you got there. So maybe there were failures, maybe there were mistakes, maybe there were these realizations along the way, conflict, obstacles. That is what creates an authentic person is you sharing the experience from all angles and connecting with people that way. I was just going to jump onto that. And I, I think that yeah. the idea of having a little bit of vulnerability in the story that you tell and, and in your own self, as you tell the story invites people to sort of lower their radar a little bit and get a little vulnerable for lack of better words with you and, and sort of jump into it together. Yeah. Agreed. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, would, I would absolutely agree as well. Um, and, and Jen, you said something earlier about your truth core. Uh, a, a lot of times I see folks that are trying to make up the story they think their audience wants to hear. Um, you, you, you have to look within your own truths and your own authenticity and build your story around that because audiences are smart, right? Just like consumers are smart and they'll smell it in a minute and then nothing else you say will resonate. Is authenticity and honesty the same thing? Hmm. That's a philosophical right. question. I think yeah, that's really philosophical. honesty within authenticity, but I think authenticity is being open to all facets of character. That's what I think. And finding what facets are true to yourself. So I don't know. If you're, if you're not honest within the authenticity, I guess it's authentic to admit that you're not being honest. Whoa. That was big. <laughs> yeah. Barani, are you back with us? Do we have a good connection? No. We can't hear you. Okay, just going to, uh, uh, there's probably a button down there you can hit to turn on your audio, but let's just keep moving things along. Um, story structure, pitch structure, deck structure. Um, there are, there have been a million books written about the right way to write a story. Um, I think that th that applies differently when we're talking about in the business sense, um, pitching your company, selling your brand. Uh, but there is something to be said for having something to gut check against when putting a presentation together. Um, is there a go-to structure that and I'll leave this to the audience, if anybody, not to the audience, to, to any one of you to start. Is there a go-to story structure that you have got check against every time you go down and, 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 and sit to write something that you make sure you're, you're hitting all of the uh, uh, certain notes? I can jump in quickly. I mean, we learned this in elementary school. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's what makes it a story. And honestly, you need all three of those components in order to convey the message, to be authentic, to share a narrative. So I would start there. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I always look at, at the hero's journey, which is thousands of years old as a story structure, Star Wars based on it, Rocky based on it. When we go into a pitch where we're, we're thinking about how we're setting up that challenge and, and how we're evolving through it as we go on that journey together. So th there's always heroes, there's always villains, there's always conflict and accomplishments and triumphs and failures. It's how you weave these elements in wisely and strategically and authentically into your story. But I would definitely look at the hero's journey. Um, you, when, when you think, are there books out there about storytelling? Sure there are. Um, and a lot of them are great. They really are. Uh, it's kind of, for me, like listening to a song about playing the guitar and learning how to play the guitar. I think you actually need to immerse in stories. You need to read them. You need to consume podcasts. Um, you need to look at other pitches and how people presented them. Watch Moth Talks. Uh, go to Hillary's thing in Philadelphia, for sure. And, and watch stories be told and learn how they're told and read how they're told and live it. Yeah, I think often people make a mistake of trying to think that there's actually too much difference between um, storytelling for, you know, entertainment and storytelling for business. And they're actually really pretty similar with, you know, as Hillary was saying, a, bit, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, as Richard was saying, you know, having something at stake, having some conflict, but also like it, always remembering to have a real character that you can root for, um, like something that you care about in the story. And that character can be you personally, and that character can be a customer that you're focused on, like a real customer, or um, it can even be your product if you do it in the right way, but something that is something that you really care about and get involved in and, um, and it has a personal angle that people can relate to. I think that's the biggest mistake that people make all the time is not, putting something personal into that story and there's no way to relate to it. There's no emotion to it. And without that, a story just falls completely flat. Okay. Ronnie, are you back with us? I hope so. All right. Well, I'm going to direct this one to you. Uh, and I'm going to talk about everybody's favorite topic, which is rehearsal. Um, I see faces just cringe when I bring it up in, in, in my own life. And uh, everybody just wants to go into things cold, but how important is rehearsal before going into a, a, a pitch or a presentation? And um, if it is a group presentation, how do you handle people saying, I don't need to rehearse. I just, I go in cold, that's how I, that's how I do it. Um, well, first of all, can you hear me all right now? Uh, it's a little muffled, but it's not breaking up, which is good. <clears throat> all right, so I'll speak up, uh, I'll articulate a little bit more. Um, so, I actually took theater in high school, and it was one of the most important classes I took because it helped me get over my fear of public speaking. And I think rehearsal is incredibly important because what it will do is help you see the conversation a lot more clearly. So you can kind of anticipate the questions that you're going to get and have responses prepared for them. So it, it's, it's sort of like if you, um, you know, if you've ever played sports and you've just gone through practice a bunch of times, um, it sort of helps with your muscle memory and just helps you kind of anticipate what's going to happen so that you're better prepared for it. So I think rehearsal is critical, especially if you're going to high stakes meetings or high stakes presentations. Rich, with the size of the teams that you work with on the big pitches, how do you deal with the naysayers that, I don't need to rehearse, I go in cold, I'm fine, I like to do it on, off the cuff. The, the wing it people? The wing it people. Wow, um, and I, I'm, I'm not one of those. So uh, we just don't do it. If something changes in the moment, right, and you want to pivot, and our great presenters can do that, then, then that's fine. But again, we're organized around a very central communication point. That if there's 12 of us in the room from different functions, we're all looking to that same central point. The way I often describe it to everybody is, this is what we're going in to do. This is what True North looks like for this pitch. 
And if I, if I were to put a sign on your parking space in the morning, and when you pulled in, there were three words there for you, you'd know exactly what your job was. Regardless of your function, this is our job. We're communicating this today. Uh, but we practice and at agencies when we go in for a big pitch. Um, Jen can tell you this. There's a whole lot of practicing that goes on for a long time, down to body language, words, visuals, timing, who we direct comments to. Jen, can you over-rehearse? Um, that's a great question. I mean, you can definitely get to a point where you feel like a robot if you're not allowing yourself to sort of put your own sorts of expression or react to the room. But man, I, I just have never felt over-prepared, you know, <laughs> no matter how much I practice. There's, there's never a time when I'm like, well, that was too much. Because practice, you know, it allows you to sort of then let go and go a little bit off script when it's, when it's appropriate. But I think it might even be better at, or a, a way to think about it or reframe it in your head is almost that you're prototyping rather than rehearsing. And you can prototype your story from, you know, the very beginning of um, when you start to write it, you know, all the way through to the end and, um, and think about it as iteration rather than rehearsal. Maybe that's a more comfortable way for people who, uh, who want to look at it differently. I, if I could jump in for a moment, I think there's a difference between prepping and prototyping and memorizing. And I think that it's really important, especially when sharing a personal story or a, a first person narrative to not memorize, even if you've already written a draft, bullet pointed it, whatever you needed to do, uh, because you want spontaneity, you want improvisation to work its way in, in the moment. Would you say, Hillary, that too much rehearsal might impact the appearance of authenticity? I think so. I think it also just, it, if, you're, if you're speaking to someone in person or even virtually, uh, you lose presence if you're going back into your mind of what you worked on versus just allowing yourself to tell this thing that you've clearly prepared and it's also an experience that has happened to you already. Yeah, I, I would agree and I, I think you also, you know, even as much as you've prepared, and as much as you've organized around a central idea, you do have to be prepared to pivot. And I think audiences want to solve and when they start to get into your story and listen to your story and are, attention, are attentive to your story. Pixar uses a great line that says, when you're telling a story, don't give them four give them two plus two. So, so bring them in to solve with you and to understand with you. And if the audience wants to ask you questions and you've got to break your script or your course, let that unfold and let that happen. Because if you're organized around a central idea, you can always get back on course. That's actually a great setup to uh, another question of mine, which is, what happens in those worst case scenarios? Uh -huh. And you're in the room, and things are going poorly. Um, and you've rehearsed and everyone you worked with thought it was great, you thought it was great, but it's just not resonating in the room, whether that room is filled with potential investors, um, potential acquirers, um, uh, future customers. How do you handle the bad days and the bad moments in the middle of one of these presentations? Um, Hillary, as someone on stage, I have to imagine that happens to you. Well, it probably never happens to you. <laughs> no, it happens. Not to you, but <laughs> for other people in your situation, how, would, how should they handle it? Yeah, so telling stories on stage, you're, sometimes you can't even see the audience, but you can feel the audience and you can hear the audience and you can know when they aren't reacting in the way that you're anticipating, whether it's you want them to laugh or gasp or just be quiet and, and attentive. So I think in those moments, again, you go back to the story itself, to the core, to the beginning, the middle and end, the hero's journey, all of that stuff, all of the prep that you've d done, but then perhaps shift what part of the story you're gonna talk about next. Or uh, if a joke doesn't land, then go back to the core of that joke and figure out what the emotional truth was of that circumstance within the story. You sort of have to do it in real time. So it's being prepped enough to pivot, I guess. So we're a little bit back to that preparation and rehearsal, right? You can, you, you, you might want to actually prepare for a worst case scenario. 
Yeah, but you can't really. You just have to trust that what you have is, is good and it might work for one audience. It might not work for another audience. So having multiple ways of handling it, I suppose. Dan, has it ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. It happens. I mean, especially in a, in a consultative role like I was in at IDEO or in my career in advertising before that, it's, you always walk into meetings with clients who, where things are just not going as you would have expected them to, or there's uh, you know, one person in the room who wants to play the naysayer and take things off course. And I think at that point, you know, I can't speak in terms of like pitching um, a, a startup idea, but in, in terms of, of being in the room with clients who are being challenging in that way, I would usually try and um, be very humble and get very curious and start asking really smart questions to get to the root of what's going on for them, be able to elicit some of that information and, um, and start to figure out how you can respond in an appropriate way. So, you know, when the, when that dynamic of the conversation shifts a little bit and they're being heard and then you can say, well, all right, let's, let's, let's unpack that. Let's talk about that a little bit and bring, then bring the elements of your story right back in that can address whatever it is they're concerned about. I, I think that's a great answer. That's the absolute right answer. Um, to, to roll that grenade on the table, if it's not going well, to, to out that right then and there and start to have a conversation. If, if things have gone off course, then you're, you're the director at that moment and you need to pull it back on course and find out why something's not resonating. Ask them really, really smart questions. I love that answer, Jen. Thank you. Barani, what if it goes off the rails in a good way? Uh, people tend to want to bring things back to center because that was what they were prepared for, but client or investor in the room starts asking interesting questions in a good way, right? It's resonating with them, but they start to send you off this way. A lot of people's gut reaction is to say, well, I, I'm gonna address that on slide. I'll get there in a few minutes. So, um, <clears throat> one thing I'd say is that uh, sometimes your audience isn't, you know, if you don't have the right audience for your story, your pitch may not work. And so I think that's the other piece of it is making sure that you are uh, connecting to the right, right audience. Um, but you know, I, I've actually had to stop myself and uh, one time in one, in one meeting um, just took a bathroom break and everyone kind of came back composed and we kind of reset the meeting to focus on the agenda at hand. So, you know, um, I think Richard was saying this before, you're in control, and so it's sort of up to you to kind of um, help steer the meeting in the direction you want to go, but by asking the intelligent questions that, that Jen was talking about, you can kind of get to the core of um, the needs of your audience, and, um, you know, if, if hopefully you've done your prep work before and you know that your audience is receptive to the message that you're having, but that, that's not going to happen 100% uh, of the time, and if it doesn't, you know, don't lose sleep over it. Just you know, get back on the horse and try to find um, the right audience for, for your message. And Seth, I think you're also alluding to uh, that, that habit that a lot of people have to sell past the close. Right. You've gotten, you've gotten a buying sign. Um, somebody's asked a really smart question that can, you're going through that hero's journey and you want to get from A to Z as you're telling your story. But gosh, in this case, if you can get to that end quickly, because that person is already where you are, don't, don't sell past the close. Close the PowerPoint and have a discussion. I think uh, Mark Twain said it beautifully that there, there's, so there's, there's no word as powerful as a well-placed pause. And a lot of people feel the need to, to fill the dead air in that moment. Um, that's when you stop. That's when you ask a smart question. That's when you make a closing statement to move toward the end. Speaking of smart questions, we actually had one ping in from the audience. Um, has anyone, has anything stood out to you as uh, something you're super proud of in terms of a presentation that you've made and uh, that really resonated not just with you and your team, but with your target audience? Is there one example um, uh, that, that 
you know, maybe one or two of you can share with us? I have something, um, if that's okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, I don't know, about five years ago at this point, I was asked to tell a story at a Victoria's Secret sales conference about shopping for underwear. And uh, it was for their 1,500 sales or managers of all the stores in the country. It was their sales conference. And I was just going like, okay, they want me to tell this story. What, what does it matter? What does shopping for underwear really mean? It's like a silly story. And I told it and I got a standing ovation because the story that I told connected directly to what these people do for a living. I was there telling the story of a customer and the experience that I had. And even though to me, I mean, I, I still shared the emotional truth of underwear shopping, but it really landed with them and, and resonated with them. So that was sort of the moment for me where I was like, well, storytelling can have an impact beyond just your personal experience. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Jen, switching gears a little bit, um, Oma Omada has had huge success, mm -hmm. raised a lot of money, um, and has pr grown and scaled in ways that I think a lot of startups dream and, 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 and hope that will happen. Um, has the way you've connected with con your customers and uh, uh, changed since the beginning? Um, and has that, that, that story or that narrative with your customers changed as you've grown? I think that it has evolved, but I don't think that it's changed. I think, you know, we really started out in a place where we were a, you know, design driven company that was really thinking about design as a way to connect to what people truly need and, and tell stories in that way. And I think that that has continued to, um, to be the case and to evolve and to, I think where Amada is very successful is that it's, it, we're helping people really understand the importance of what we're doing in a way that's not just about um, the science of it, but about the, the sort of the human experience of, you know, um, finding out that you might be pre-diabetic and, and learning that there's, there's an alternative, that there's things that you can do to sort of um, stop the, the course of the disease from developing. And, you know, you can, you can do that in a couple of ways. One would be like to hand somebody some awful pamphlet and say, you know, um, you should get yourself checked and here's why. And another way might be to tell a really compelling story about someone who might be like you, someone who might um, have some of the experiences that you've had and, and sort of get someone engaged in that story and get them thinking like, oh, maybe this is something I should pay attention to um, and then start to um, engage with the product. And that's like a much more powerful way to do it. And I think that that's what we've been able to do. And that's what we're continuing to do and um, and even doubling down on and, and trying to go deeper into that kind of storytelling because, you know, just stats and figures just don't get you very far with people. Um, but telling a compelling story always gets some kind of engagement and gets people's hearts open in ways. And I mean, that's the, that's such an important thing in healthcare too, is right. Like if you, if you're only engaging people's heads, it's so easy to dismiss. It's so easy to just be like, yeah, that's for somebody else. Like I don't really, it's not important to me right now, but if you can get people, you know, in their hearts and in, in their sort of the, that something that feels right to them, that feels instinctively like, yeah, I should check this out. I should investigate a little bit further. It's just, it, it actually has the power to, to change people's lives and save people's lives. And it sounds so like, ooh, changing lives, saving lives, but it's, it's true. Like if you can get someone off the course of, of going down this path to chronic disease, to actually take action and, and change their habits, change their health, like all of that, like that's an incredibly powerful thing to be able to do. Absolutely. <clears throat> Barani, um, how do you get everybody in the organization telling the same story? How do, how do you get, uh, achieve alignment um, when it comes to uh, team members, employees, uh, 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 maybe chairman and founders who aren't involved as much anymore, but make sure everybody's sort of singing the same song? Uh, I think that is like one of the hardest things to do. Um, but I think it's Why super important. <laughs> um, but I think it's super important that you you master that skill if you're going to be an entrepreneur because 
if not everyone is saying the same story, then they're going to be, they could potentially be saying conflicting things about your, you or your product. You don't want that. You want everyone saying um, something similar and, you know, kind of singing your praises or the praises of the product. So, um, you know, I, I think this goes along the lines of there being, and I'm very, I'm generalizing like crazy here, but like two types of presentations, you know, if you're just doing a pitch to an audience, you know, there's, you can't do too much customization there necessarily. Like, um, but when you're in a room of key decision makers, what you want to be trying to do is figure, you want to figure out who is the influencer in the room, right? Because you know that if you can win that person over, they're then going to be on your team to help kind of convince the other folks. So, you know, you yourself are never going to be able to convince everyone in the organization or everyone on your team. You're just trying to find the people that your message resonates with the most and who are, you know, kind of key influencers in the organization or on the team or on, on that, you know, pod or whatever. Um, and kind of jointly create that conversation because if, if, if it goes that way, you know, it becomes a joint kind of conversation and people are helping you shape the vision or, or the message, you're, you're much more likely to get your point across than if you just try to, you know, shove something down someone's throat and expect them to repeat whatever it is that you want done. Rich, on the opposite end of the spectrum, telling your story outwardly, right? From a marketing, communications, branding standpoint, shifting gears a little bit from the, in the room presentation and pitch to investors or, or, or potential customers. Um, where are the, what are innovative ways today to better tell your story um, to the masses, be it digital or otherwise? So, you know, it's, it's really interesting because when I think about pharma marketing and, and healthcare marketing, um, direct to consumer in the United States will actually uh, hit its, it'll enter into its third decade in 2017. And it, it largely hasn't changed and it's frustrating to me and it's what I work very hard to change because we do massive TV, which startups can't afford, and we pepper some digital around it. And, and then we keep doing it again. It becomes this cycle and it's almost exactly mirrored to the cycle of addiction. But that's not where, where people make decisions. People make decisions in, in the crowd, in their social networks. And I, I just wrote an article that was in media post. And one of the things I said in it was that you get the diagnosis of a chronic disease. It's like getting a full-time lifetime job that you're clearly and completely unqualified for. So showing them a commercial with a dog running on the beach is, is insane. There are more modern ways to do that, involving their influencers, telling the stories in the places that they already go, collaborating with the people that they are already influenced by and who they trust, and leveraging those environments. Social socials disproportionately influential. How do you use that to help them be part of that story, not just talk at them. Pharma is really big about testimonials. I get frustrated with most of them they do because the second the video rolls, I already know how it's going to end. I was sick, it was terrible. I went to my doctor, my doctor told me about this drug and, and now there's unicorns dancing around. It's, it's just not realistic and it's too expected. But when people start to get authentic and tell their real stories and we can capture that in their real words, that's wonderful. So I would think in digital about social and influencer marketing. I would also think about experiential marketing. Can you solve a problem together with your customer? And you know, one of the things I think you were alluding to is, is the how, the modality, visuals for sure, graphics, videos, visuals, extremely powerful. We process images about 60,000 times faster than we do text. But you have to use both. There are those people that are didactic and want to read, and there's people that are visual and kinesthetic that want to touch it and that want to watch it. So there's not a one-size-fits-all. It really is about knowing your customer. Mm -hmm. Jen, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just thinking. I, I love what you're saying there, Richard, and I think it's a, that point on authenticity is, is really well put. One of the things that we try and do at Omada is to tell all the sides of the story, right? There's moments when the program is working really, really well. 
And there's moments when, you know, things don't go so well when you're, you know, you're, if you're on a, a behavior change journey, right? There's, there's really hard times during that when things are not working out for you and being able to connect with somebody on that level, as well as the sort of end point success moment is a powerful way to say like, yeah, you know, we see you as a whole human being with like ups and downs and everything in between. And yeah, it's going to be hard, but yeah, we're going to help you through it. And that kind of connection is so much more powerful than just like, you know, the, the pull out shot of the pants, look how much I lost, you know, <laughs> and nobody believes that anymore. And they shouldn't because it's not a real thing. And because they're just wearing bigger pants. Exactly. You go out, you buy a giant pair of pants, <laughs> advertising done, man, go back to the seventies. Things were easier then. <laughs> hey, hey, Seth, I have one more thing I want to add. Yeah, to um, I, I think the other piece of it is relevance too. Um, because, you know, I'll just use LearnBop as an example. Um, when LearnBop was started, at, so LearnBop is a, it's an automated tutoring software for teaching mathematics. And when we started it around uh, 2010, at that time, um, in the education industry, the entire industry was talking about a more rigorous math curricul curriculum. And so everyone was already like really receptive to this idea of talking about math education, all the education companies were like figuring out ways to innovate in math. And so, um, you know, I think if you're, you want to kind of maximize the, the effect of your presentation or your pitch or your, you know, your story, making sure that what you're saying is relevant to your audiences, you know, can dramatically increase the probability that you have success. Um, Hillary. Yes. Let's cite some examples. I think we've all, I, I think from a storytelling standpoint, we've discussed the importance of things resonating, being able to place yourself in that situation. So um, who's doing a good job that we all might recognize and might go have a little aha moment and we should be paying a, a more attention to? And just to prepare the other three, I'm going to ask you the same question. <laughs> uh, Richard, start Googling really good storytelling right now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's all about finding, it's all about taste as well. So there's, there's a lot of people that do it really well. And I think it's finding those people that do it in the style that you connect with the most or think would be most effective for your business. Uh, podcasts are a great place to start. Uh, the Moth has a great podcast where there's stories every single week. Uh, going online, YouTube videos, again, from The Moth, Tell Me a Story has a Vimeo channel. You can peruse videos from all of our past shows. There's, there's, they're all wonderful storytellers. Uh, but I also, in prepping for this webinar, I have a really great example of storytelling as branding. And it was a YouTube video yeah. that JC Penny put out in June that was part of their Here I Am campaign. And it featured uh, five women who would fit in the plus size market, uh, telling their story, not just of, of the horrible things of what it's like to be plus size in this society, but also the amazing things and all of the things that they're doing that go beyond their external and beyond their size. And uh, it also features a woman who won Project Runway who has a fashion line for JCPenney, but that sort of ended up being in the back burner of the video. It was these five personal stories that were just authentic, real, and just presented in a really simple way. So I recommend looking up that on YouTube. There's that word authentic again, keeps yeah. coming up, something <laughs> to remember. Yes. Jen, what about you? Who's doing a good job out there? What brand is just crushing it? And Red Bull is not an acceptable answer today. Well, I'm going to have to come back to me then, dang it. Um, you know, ironically, and, and you can argue on both sides of the spectrum about where you're going to land on this, but I think Airbnb is doing a pretty amazing job. Um, you may have heard about a few gaffes that they had with a, a local campaign that ran in San Francisco that people really didn't like. But overall, like their Live There campaign, I think is really interesting and compelling. And one of the things that I love about it is, you know, storytelling isn't just marketing and it isn't just like a story that you make in, in a presentation. It's literally everything that your business does. So, and you can see the Live There campaign coming out in all these different ways for Airbnb. So um, they've extended this idea into their local guides. Um, 
into local experiences, which is a new thing that they just kind of launched into this program they're calling Sonoma Select, which is out here, which is like when you, uh, when you go and stay at a, uh, one of the places in Sonoma, you have like this little gift basket that's ready for you and like special guidebooks that are ready for you. So there's all of these different things that they're doing throughout the product that really pay off this idea of live there, that you are living like a local and not just as a tourist. Um, and I've heard arguments on both sides as well saying like, well, this is polarizing. This is, you know, the, the story that they're telling is really like exclusive and it's just for, you know, it's for people who are poo-pooing being a tourist and it should be for everybody. And to which I would argue, no way, like great brands tell stories that are specific, that I would rather have a brand that I fall in love with and that a certain small group of people or, you know, uh, well, I can't say small, you want a, a, at least a large enough people to, a group of people to make your brand successful, but that a certain group of people fall in love with and that some people don't like that much because then you've got that love relationship. Like having a brand that a, a, like everybody is kind of like okay with just won't get you very far. So I think they're doing a fantastic job at sparking conversation and making a group of people fall in love with their brand and what they're standing for. Rich, what do you got? You probably see more of this than anybody else. Uh, yeah, I see a bunch. I'll tell you what. I um, be, Even before the Super Bowl last year, when Always launched Like a Girl, it's just, mm -hmm. just such a beautiful story because they, they unlocked the cultural ill of, of Like a Girl being pejorative. And, you know, in that moment I was watching and I realized guilty as charged, I'd said it. And I'd said it to my boys in front of my daughter, and it changed me in that moment. But what they've done behind that and the content they've created behind that, awesome. Chipotle, um, they E. coli proofed themselves in so many ways by talking about where our food comes from and sustainable farming. And now people are eating there again, even though they had this horrible E. coli issue. Um, American Express, Small Business Saturdays began with helping small businesses tell stories about small business and, and attract customers in because people use American Express and small businesses because of the fees. The first year of that campaign was immensely successful. And now all the stories behind that have created what is a national holiday, Small Business Saturday. Uh, I think it's beautiful. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite recent pieces of storytelling was a book by a, a guy named Ravi Mehta, and you can look it up. It's a graphic novel on uh, Nikolai Tesla. It's a comic book. I'm in my 50s, and I read this comic book, and I couldn't stop reading it because it was visually compelling. And he made the history of Nikolai Tesla into this story with conflict and achievements. And at the end of it, I'm like, Ask me anything about Nikolai Tesla. I know everything about him. And it never felt like work. It was easy. So that that's one I love too. That's awesome. Brian, I know you got excited to share an example, but we're getting close to the end. So I want to actually ask another question. Um, uh, <laughs> my question is, it's actually from the audience and I'm trying to think of a good way to, to share it. Um, and it, it just so happens that specifically uh, DreamIt's companies work in some pretty complex categories, right? We're talking about healthcare, we're talking about education, um, you know, we're not making gum, right? This is not just a general consumer product that tastes great, less filling kind of conversation can be had. Um, how does one deal with really complex topics, but still manage to engage um, and build rapport with an audience, whether that's in a room or that's, you know, outward facing from a marketing and branding standpoint. So again, dealing with super complex topics, but helping to keep them, um, uh, you know, engaged and interested. I think um, one of the most important things that you can do is find out what's in it for your audience. Right. If if there is a reason that they should be paying attention to you, because your product's going to help them, or or your company is going to save their you know 
their relative life or something like that, um, then you've got their attention. After that, you got to make sure what you say is, you know, actually going to help them. You know, you don't be terrible if you uh, told this great story, you got everyone's attention, and then you actually didn't have the, the meat to, to back it up. So, you know, education and healthcare are, are probably two of the most important uh, things in anyone's life because they affect the quality of life. And so uh, people will pay attention to you to the extent that your um, your business or your work is going to have like a meaningful impact on them. I think that's what gets your foot in the door. After that, you truly have to have something that's going to work. Um, otherwise, you know, people will feel like you're, you're kind of wasting their time. So I think it's all about the, the right incentive and finding the um, the most likely thing that will, will will get them to pay attention to you. Jen, any feedback on this about uh, complexity versus simplicity in, in storytelling? Yeah, I think it's it's inevitable, um, especially in the areas that we all work in, that you're going to have some really complex stuff. And I think there's a bunch of different tools that folks can rely on to make things understandable, especially to a mass audience. I think one of them that you can employ um, is metaphor. That's a really great way for people to start to understand something that's complex. Um, a good example of that is a project that um, I didn't work on, but I was aware of at IDEO for Genentech, right? So we're talking about um, a, a really complex thing with genetics to a mass audience. And there was a, a project that they did where they did an installation that turned your own personal genetics, so a swab, get it tested, into a piece of music, right? And every individual had their own um, custom composition. And so you could start to understand how your genetics played out through sound. Um, and it was really engaging. Everybody wanted to participate in it. And so suddenly you went from something that was sort of like heady and dry, like genetics, to something that was engaging and easy to understand, like music. And it made that connection for people in a really simple and beautiful and memorable way. So finding the right metaphor can go a long way. Awesome. Awesome. Um, one of the things that continually comes up as we sort of wind, start winding things down here and um, I, I absolutely welcome uh, the audience to continue to ask questions and, and uh, I will continue to, to convey them to the panelists. But one thing that's been asked a, a few times actually, I think is good as we come towards the end is uh, wh where does one learn to do this better? <laughs> where, can, where can we go? We're not all great at this. Um, not all of us have Rich's sense of humor or Hillary's stage presence. Um, so how do we improve? Are there books? Are there classes? Um, are there podcasts that you can recommend um, to everybody listening to? I mean, other than this panel, um, that <laughs> would be helpful to people on, uh, in growing in, in this area. Hillary, start with you. Well, I teach classes through Tell Me a Story. Uh, so yeah, I recommend taking some sort of storytelling class or, or if it's the public speaking aspect of the storytelling, like the, I don't, I have the story, but how do I present it? Finding a, a place where you can work it out either with a, a group of people in a class or with peers in a social setting. I think working out a, a personal narrative is really important. There's also a really great manifesto by the artistic director of the moth uh, on transom.org. It's, you can just search for storytelling manifesto. I think it's like 20 something pages long uh, with, with clips that you can watch and listen to along the way. So I highly recommend that as well for those that wanna self teach or self practice. I think Rich just looked it up and is buying it right now. It's free, it's free, you don't have to buy it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I literally just wrote it down. Yeah, Rich, what about you? Any places you can recommend any reading that we, we, we have to, other than the Nikola Tesla comic book that you read? Yeah, um, I think just watching stories and watching stories be told and reading stories. Um, I've, I've read, you know, all kinds of books on, on the alchemy of storytelling. And they're all good, and I pick something up from all of them. But I don't think you you 
you really get skilled at it until you do it. So you've got to consume yourself in it. And it's, it's entertaining, first of all, right? To, to read a, a great short story or to watch a great moth talk or watch Hillary's talks. I think that's how you get better at it. And then you practice and you do it in front of the mirror and you try it on your friends and your family and strangers. That's how you get great at it. Yeah. I'll give a shameless plug to the right. I U U uh, storytelling series that um, it comes up. I think they're doing it a couple times a year. Um, the the last class just ended, but um, in a couple of months, another one will come around. And I think the thing that's great about it, other than the fact that I taught it, ha ha, um, is that it's it's very participatory. Like it's it's definitely about iterating, trying, working with other people, because to, to all of the folks here who've been saying like, yeah, it's all about jumping in and doing it. Like you have to practice, you have to try, you have to um, do multiple drafts. So um, I think that class is, it does a pretty good job of getting people in the ring and doing it. And also there's a great, um, there's a great video, if you just Google uh, Ira Glass storytelling, where he talks about some of the elements of storytelling. He talks a lot about using anecdote and reflection and how those two core components working together make a powerful story. It's like 10 minutes long, but it's a really great primer to sort of get yourself excited about um, storytelling. Awesome. Barani? Yeah, so I've got uh, a couple of things. Two of them are very, very cheesy, I'm gonna admit, but I, they help me, so I'll share them in case I could help anyone else. Um, so um, I had no sort of background in business or starting it. I had no idea of like starting a company when I was little or anything. So I was just trying to get up to speed as much as I could. And in 2010, you know, that was sort of like when Apple was peaking big time with all its products. And so everyone talked about Steve Jobs a bunch. And so I, I watched every single one of his um, sort of presentations at the annual uh, conference. And then he also, there's also this book uh, called The Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs, which sounds totally hokey. Um, but it was pretty, it was pretty useful because it kind of broke down like some of the techniques that he used and, 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 and stuff like that. So I thought that was helpful. And then, you know, because psychology is a big part of storytelling, um, there's this book called Presuasion. Um, and it's by a guy, I think his name is like Robert Caldini or something like that. And, it just um, is really helpful at kind of understanding some of the tactics of um, how the you know psychology works and, and what you can be doing to prep a person to even listen to your story so that they accept it. So I thought those were some pretty good books and videos to check out. Uh, I'm going to talk to um, It's actually recommended to me years ago that I've read a, a few times at this point. Uh, I don't know if you guys have checked it out. I'm sure, Rich, it's come across your desk made to stick uh why some ideas survive and others die by dan heath um i mean he grabbed me in that book on like page one i was already hooked uh and the example he used was the difference between telling people that uh popcorn in movie theaters wasn't necessarily healthy it has this much fat and this much salt and so on and so forth versus actually just simply sharing a visual that that large popcorn in the movie theater has as much fat as a Big Mac. And all of a sudden, like people's minds changed overnight as to uh, what they were ordering and, and, and how they were eating and, and, and what foods like that represented in terms of, uh, you know, popcorn's healthy, that's like a healthy snack. And it really, really wasn't. Um, I, I did just get another question come through really quick. Uh, it was um, from one of our uh, graduates from the, the last cycle. And the question is, is there a difference between pitching from the stage, i.e. a pitch contest um, with a big audience, versus pitching in a small room um, uh, uh, or, or more of a presentation to like a, a VC? So uh, obviously there is a difference, but I, I guess the question really is, how do you adapt um, if you're really prepared for a big room going into a small room or, or vice versa? Jen, maybe you can jump in on that one. Wow, yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I can. Uh, let me think. <laughs> I know we only have a second left, and I'm trying to say something actually intelligent about that. Um, I think it does come down to that question of earlier of knowing your audience, right? So if you're 
if you're having to adapt really quickly, is there something about, go, you know, I would imagine that you'd be going from the large stage to the small stage and not the, the other way around. But um, if you are able to think really specifically about the person that you are then pitching to or the small group of people that you're pitching to, what do they care about? What's in it for them? And how can you pull threads from that, that larger narrative that might get more specific to that smaller audience? You know, in other words, customization in a small room becomes a lot more important than when you're in a big room telling the story to 150 people versus five. Absolutely. You have a chance to make it personal. You have a chance to make that one-on-one -on -one connection, even, even little things like making more eye contact and, you know, sort of involving them in the conversation a little bit, I think could be helpful. Well, yeah, Seth, real, real sorry, quick. Rich, did you have something for that? Yeah, I know we're ending, but I walked in one time thinking I was having a meeting with two people and opened the door and it was an auditorium <laughs> and a stage. And uh, the, the person who worked for me who had set this up um, just looked at me and he's a great friend. He goes, I am so blanking sorry. <laughs> I said, we'll be fine. And so I walked in, I said, I don't have any slides and I really hope to have a conversation. And I just took a chair down and I sat and I asked everybody to kind of move in where they were and we had a conversation. So I wasn't prepared for it, but the worst thing you could possibly do in that situation is I'm gonna go up and have an intimate conversation with 400 people on a stage. It's gonna be really awkward. And the same goes for when you thought you were on a stage and it's a couple people and you take out your PowerPoint, your body language is for a stage, and that's all wrong. So you have to be prepared to adapt. That's great. That's great. Uh, anyone else want to add to that, or shall we move towards wrapping things up? I just have one last thing to point out. I think yep. that, that regardless of, of if it's a large audience, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, I think the stakes of the story itself need to be the same. They need to be high. They need to be invested. And then you adapt from there and, and talk what, you know, Rich just shared a wonderful story about that. Mm -hmm. awesome. uh, well, I personally just want to thank you guys for sharing your expertise with me and, and with the entire audience here. I think it's been tremendously engaging. I think that, frankly, when it comes to having panels, a panel full of really good storytellers tends to be that much more interesting than, frankly, a, a panel full of analysts. But we'll see how that one goes later on uh, uh, in the cycle. Um, but I, I'd love to, if anybody has anything they want to share, uh, from a closing standpoint, places you'll be, Hillary, if you want to let us know when you're, we'll be able to see you next or um, things that are coming up at Omada that we should know about, Jen. Uh, if there's anything you want to share now is definitely the time. Uh, but I do want to say on behalf of Dream and thank you guys for participating in this today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Yeah, any, thank you very much. Any plugs? Yeah. Just thank you for the opportunity and the <laughs> lovely being with all of you today and chatting about this. All right. I learned Mike. a lot from all of you, so thanks very much. And Rich, when you're in New York, I hope to see you that next time you actually make it up here and we'll get a chance to hang out. Right, well, come hang out with, with uh, Hillary and me in Philly. Yes. Even, even better. And even come better. out to the West Coast and say hi. <laughs> oh my God, I'm getting all these invitations. <laughs> Am I starting to blush? Um, all right, Mike, if you're listening in the back end there, I think we can bring this thing to a close. I want to, again, thanks everybody for participating. Uh, this will be available on the YouTube channel uh, within the next few days. Uh, we'll share that with everybody who came out. We'll also try and get you some of the links of uh, the recommended books um, and authors that came up during the, during the program. So thanks, everybody.